Hi, um, I am uh, Kea Njaria and I'm here with um, Rachel Harrison and we're part of the CCLPS, the Center for uh, Cultural, Literary and Postcolonial Studies. And we're here to introduce two of the uh, MA programs we have to offer. Um, I'll be talking first about MA Comparative Literature and then um, Professor Harrison will be speaking about MA uh, Cultural Studies. And I think we'll have some time as well, probably at the end to answer some questions or to talk about the tasters. Um, and the idea, I think probably, you know, um, the idea of these sessions is to, uh, to, well, to give you a taste of what it would be like to be a student here. So they're, they're a little bit like tiny lectures um, where we introduce some of the things and the ideas we work on um, in the classroom and um, in your research and, and what you'll be exposed to. So with that in mind, I will start and I see, um, let me just, let me see there's some chats. Ah, yes. Hello to everybody. I apologize um, So, for not saying that first off. Uh, so let me start by sharing this little PowerPoint with you Oops, at the very end. Excuse me. Um, and today, our, my taster session is going to be called Scripted Bodies. In the second term of comparative literature in our core module, we actually spend a lot of time thinking about uh, representations of the body and what that is. So I thought I'd, I'd do a little bit. It's not exactly like um, a lecture that I've given this year because, um, well, I thought maybe I didn't want to spoil the content if you did decide to come next year. Uh, so it's a bit of a mismatch, but uh, definitely something you'll come across at one point or the other were you to do uh, the MA in comparative literature. So before we start, I wanted to say a very brief word about um, well, where we are as a, a, as a program of, of comparative literature. Um, and just to say that, you know, we probably all know, for those of you who are interested in comparative literature, you probably know that comparative literature really started as a European um, discipline, a European endeavor. It was engaged with European literatures. And it was, uh, the idea was really to move across nation, uh, national languages and nation state boundaries. So to compare German and French or English and, and Spanish was to really radically reorder the world. And for various reasons, and there's a lot um, that has been written, written about it, it has moved also to the US. There are also, it stayed predominantly European, certainly in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, early, early 20th century, uh, towards the mid of the 20th century, um, the push for inclusion, the push to think about literatures from outside Europe was growing greater. But actually the main force of comparative literature is uh, what is now called a turn inwards, a turn towards theory and criticism. And that's a legacy we carry on today. So where are we then with SOAS as comparative literature? As you know, SOAS is a school of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And of course, we study the literatures of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. So how does MA comparative literature with its European roots really fit in? Well, we take the strains of comparative literature from the 21st century, where um, from our very starting point, it's a global and multilingual um, project. It's political um, and it's invested in examining literatures through critical frames relevant to Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. So we take the legacy of uh, transnationalism and we take the legacy of, um, of theory and criticism, but our starting place is a really different one where we start not really in the Eurocentric and the, in the world of Europe, um, but rather in the world of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. So that's that's where we're starting. Okay. And so what is these, what are these critical frames that we think about? Well, as you see, uh, through the second half of the year, but also actually in the first half of the year, there, there, these will come up in various different ways. Some of them are really invested in 20th century thinking, like post-colonial studies, and some of them have sort of gathered momentum and changed direction in the 21st century. So some of the things you might come to do in MA comparative literature are to study eco-criticism and queer theory, multilingualism, subaltern studies, potty politics, border thinking, and race. And the, the title of this taster session today, Scripted Bodies, really comes from, um, from an idea, a conceptual framework that emerges in the larger topic of body politics. So that's what we're going to turn our attention to now. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to take a small quote, a uh, small extract from the novel, The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy, written in 1997. Some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you fi might find it new and might, that might be new to it, but I just thought we'd, we'd start with this. So he wore a thin white cloth with his lo uh, around his loins, looped between his dark legs. He shook the water from his hair. She could see her smile in the dark his white, sudden smile that had carried him from boyhood into manhood, his only luggage. They looked at each other. They weren't thinking anymore. The time for, what, uh, for that had come and gone. Smashed smiles lay ahead of them, but that would be later. She unbuttoned her shirt. She stood there, skin to skin, her brownness against his blackness, her softness against her hardness. Okay, these are the two, two characters of the novel, Amul and Veluta. Um, and the question we have to ask ourselves when we, when we ever, whenever we read literature is, well, how do we read literature? How do we read these passages? How do we understand these bodies? Okay. So I argue, I do close reading, and if we were in class together, um, we'd probably do this work together, so it wouldn't just be me lecturing. But, you know, we look at the passage, and I've put it again on the, on the right-hand side here so you can see it that the narrator follows Amu's hidden gaze. So she's somewhere else and she's staring at him. She's watching him. And you can see, she could see him smile in the dark. He doesn't know she's there, right? And it's construct constructed, these, his body is constructed and their bodies, these images that are being played here are constructed through various juxtapositions, right? White cloth, dark legs, brownness, blackness, hardness, softness. Um, and this juxtaposition then gives way to a union, right? They stood there skin to skin. And arguably the, the union itself is, is more profound, is more transcendent because um, it overcomes these, these juxtapositions. Okay, so this is the images that we're looking at, two bodies together. But there's more, and we could take Elizabeth Gross's idea of the volatile, of volatile bodies um, as a starting point to also thinking about what's happening in this scene. Elizabeth Gross, Gross says that every body is marked by the history and the specificity of its existence. It is possible to construct a biography, a history of the body for each individual and social body. Or she goes on to say, the body functions almost as a black box in this account. It is acted upon, inscribed, peered into, information is extracted from it, and disciplinary regimes are imposed on it. So the body, despite looking here, you know, and despite us feeling, you know, the, the sort of the, the romance, the, the desire, the sensuality of these two bodies to coming together, according to Gross, are really um, are, are are also are also scripted. They're part of um, regimes, disciplinary regimes, part of history, and uh, that construct the specificity of existence. But also in literature, because of course, when we talk about bodies, we can talk about bodies that exist in the world or the representation of bodies. So in literature, we have to think about double scripting, the scripting of history or the regime of or disciplinary regimes and that make the characters recognizable to us, right, that we recognize from the outside world and the script uh, and the scripting of the literary text. So the literary text uses Veluta's body, uses Amu's body in particular ways, right, to make the point of the novel, to make, uh, to, to fulfill its aesthetic interests, its political interests, its, um, yeah, its, yeah, its poetic interests even. So the literary text may seek to reverse or complicate, reject or embrace society's script of a body. So Veluta, for example, is, um, is an undercast or, or Dalit character. Um, and and, and the, the novel works with this notion of untouchability of who a Veluta is allowed to touch. And, and of course, the other side of that of um, who is allowed to touch him. And it recasts his characters desirous, playful, beautiful, rather than polluted, um, polluted, um, poor, impoverished, and worn out. So this way of recasting the Lutha is part of the project of the novel itself, 
but we only understand that project fully by recognizing the, 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 the disciplinary regime that goes with the label and the writing of the Lutha as a Dalit character. So both of these are at work in the literary representation. But we can go further than that, right? Later on in this scene, um, Roy, the narrator, uh, talks about um, the, the, the act of lovemaking as biology designed, uh, or she describes it as biology designed the dance, terror timed it, timed it dictated the rhythm which their bodies answered each other. And Ejaz Ahmed, um, a very famous um, critic, um, has written about the novel's private pleasures. It is a utopic transgression, he calls it. And one um, which is the discourse of which one in which this discourse of pleasure is also profoundly political. The Brahmin woman with the untouchable man, the, the Dalit character, the Dalit man, and their union together, right, is not merely about two bodies together, but about the um, um, but about the transgression of history, the transgression of those regimes of power. So the body is scripted as it enters the text and it's re-scripted by the text itself to fill the aesthetic, thematic and political ambitions of its literature. And these are the kind of things we would work on um, in comparative literature as we worked together. So that is okay, almost exactly 15 minutes of my, um, of my taste here. Thank you very much. Um, and I don't know if we'll do questions now, but I'm happy to answer any questions as they come up. Shall we do questions now, Kea, to see if anyone has questions on your presentation? Sure, absolutely. Or indeed on comparative literature. Of course. <laughs> and I guess if there are questions, you need to put them into the chat. And nothing appearing there yet. <laughs> so should I, maybe I should take this opportunity then to, to move on and do you a, um, a quick presentation as well, another taster session on, um, on cultural studies. I'm just going to close my balcony door just a second, sorry. Sorry, it just gives a, a bit better sound. Okay, so, um, there are three programs that we run from the Center for Cultural, Literary and Postcolonial Studies. Um, one is MA Comparative Literature that uh, that uh, Kea has just spoken about. Um, I convene MA um, Cultural Studies and then we have MA Postcolonial Studies as, as well. Um, I'm going to give you a quick taster session on the kinds of things we talk about in cultural studies and it's interesting what connections there are between comparative literature and cultural studies and of course the way that the programs are set up means that you can whatever you take your kind of core course in you can take the the um, theory and tech theory course relating to the other other fields as well so you're not constrained to um, pin yourself down to 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 one particular area okay let's see if i can um let's see if i can manage to share my screen effectively okay i'll do it as a slideshow is that showing okay all right good so there are there's a lot of overlap between um, cultural studies and comparative literature, and indeed the the the, the topics that are discussed in um, in, in MA postcolonial studies as well, and there are clear connections between the kinds of issues that uh, Kay has just been talking about, and, and which I which I'm going to talk about in terms of the question of hybrid cultures. So just have a quick look at what's in the chat there, in case there's a question there. Okay, that just says okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so um, we start off in uh, cultural studies by thinking about what cultural studies actually is. And it emerged um, as, as a field in the UK, particularly uh, strongly connected with this person in this photograph here, Stuart Hall and the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies. And so it's connected up quite, quite strongly right from the start with ideas of cultural identity and multiculturalism. 
and the and the kind of way in which we work from that in SOAS, because this is an MA in cultural studies of Asia, Africa and the Middle East, um, is to try to extrapolate from the origins of cultural studies what that means for generating um, a, a question of what cultural studies means in relation to Africa, Asia and the Middle East. And because cultural studies is uh, in some ways very theoretical, we also kind of thinking about the questions of what it means to generate theory from Asia, Africa and the Middle East so that we're not um, disregarding so-called Western theory, but incorporating it into a wider question of how you might theorize different parts of the of the world through questions of identity and belonging that emerge from those societies themselves. Nevertheless, Stuart Hall is a very foundational figure and I've taken this photograph of Stuart Hall from an exhibition that's currently on at Tate Britain, um, which I actually took the MA Cultural Studies students to this year, uh, Life Between Islands. It's an exhibition of Caribbean British art from the 1950s. And um, although we don't technically cover the Caribbean as part of Asia, Africa and the Middle East, one of the things that seemed to me really important about this exhibition was the way in which some of the artworks displayed here were able to demonstrate precisely the kinds of ideas we had been discussing about cultural identity, cultural belonging, um, how culture gets connected up with questions of representation, and also something that seemed extremely important in terms of thinking about how we theorize culture um, beyond, uh, beyond the West and in relation to Asia, Africa and the Middle East. And that's the question of hybridity, which is why I would put hybridity into the title here of hybrid cultures. Because one of the things I think that's extremely interesting about cultural studies or about culture in particular is the fact that when you start examining it closely and drilling down into, into culture, um, although it has multiple different definitions, one of the ways in which politicians like to define culture in terms of national identity is to make it rather static. You know, that, you know, for example, to be British means to have the following characteristics. And when you unravel that and un unpick it, the exciting thing about that is that culture is incredibly um, unstable and fluid and it's made up of multiple different influences and so the question of hybridity wherever we're looking at culture in any part of the world seems to be quite an important one to be able to to look at the way in which culture is in constant change it's never static and it's made up of a number of different influences so this artwork in uh, Life Between Islands struck me as an extremely good example of hybridity and cultural hybridity. And it's a composite figure that's made up of um, of those kind of travel bags. Apparently they're called Ghana to go bags, although I know that they certainly used in Asia and in other parts of of the world as well, and they're not confined to Ghana. Um, so the character is dressed in in part of fabric made up of these kind of portable, highly portable light bags, and everything that that connotes about the question of movement and transport and you know, traveling without wealth. Um, but it's also overlaid as well with the fact that some of these patterns look like tartan, so they also kind of have a, an influence from uh, Scottish culture as well. Um, there's there are parts of sort of African cloth here in the figure and different kind of attributes that make this a highly composite figure and a very good example of cultural hybridity. There are endless examples in this exhibition. I really recommend it to you. Um, and it's also really, I mean, one of the great things about doing cultural studies in London and having so many different sites that you can go to in, in exhibitions and so forth means that you can always kind of support the material that we're coming across in class with um, actual exhibitions that you can go and visit and 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 um, per both permanent collections and, and temporary ones. And this one, Reflections, 
contemporary art of the Middle East and North Africa that was shown at the British Museum uh, a few months ago is another really good example. Um, in particular, one of the images that I took from this exhibition is this one here on the left. Again, a very hybrid composite character um, drawn by uh, a young Iranian artist um, with uh, different, different script, with multiple multiple faces, different kind of um, elements brought together, which talk very much to the to the question of not only of hybridity, but of multiple cultural identities. Um, the, the fact that, not, that nothing is stable, that it's fluid, and that people can represent themselves in a multiple of multiple different ways. So um, there's always a good opportunity to get extra inspiration to back up the kinds of things that we're talking about in the classroom with material that we're seeing um, in, in the kind of local area in terms of exhibitions and so forth. Um, I didn't I didn't put my timer on, but I keep a, keeping an eye on the clock so I don't speak for too long um, because uh, my own personal interest, I came to cultural studies having done a degree, uh, an undergraduate degree at SOAS in Thai language and art history. And uh, my my PhD at, also at SOAS is, is on uh, contemporary Thai literature. And my current job title is uh, working on Thai cultural studies. So I my go to place for uh, for any kind of illustration or example of um, cultural studies from Asia, Africa and the Middle East is my comfort zone of Thailand. And just to kind of round off this talk in terms of um, examples of cultural hybridity, I wanted to refer to one of my favorite Thai films, which is a, a cowboy film from the late 1990s. In Thai, it's called Fata Lai John, and it was marketed in the UK as Tears of the Black Tiger, um, released in 2000, and was very much a kind of mark of the success of the Thai film industry going into, as we say in Thai, um, going international, making it big in a, at the Cannes Film Festival. It's an interesting film for me because um, it's again a great example of hybridity. Um, it's It takes up the kind of question of Thai cowboy culture. Yes, there is such a thing. Um, and uh, the film is incredibly visually uh, uh, resplendent. It dresses its cowboys in multicolored clothes. Um, the whole film has an aesthetic that is looks like a kind of hand colored photograph. And the cowboys in this film, although they are kind of really Thai bandits, very much kind of adopt cowboy motifs. The film is made up of multiple references, both to old Thai cinema and to famous cowboy films, including um, Once Upon a Time in the West and so on. So picking up the different kind of references that you find in contemporary cinema, for example, is a great way of exploring the multiple kind of influences on cultural products that come from different parts of the world, uh, breaking down the kind of borderlines and, and narrow definitions of what national culture actually is. And in that sense, it can have a very kind of subversive element. So one of one of the things that we're often coming back to in cultural studies is thinking about the way in which in, in at one end of the spectrum, culture is very much caught up in part of national belonging and national identity, in which case it's rather sort of static and conservative in nature. And at the other at the other end of the spectrum, culture is always is often used as a way of um, articulating modes of resistance to dominant narratives. So that play between um, the, what's what's sort of culturally acceptable through the so-called Ministry of Culture and so on, on the one hand, and the the kind of work that artists and writers are doing that are often part of counterculture, is a really interesting one. Um, 
I've got a picture here of the former king of Thailand here in much many younger years visiting America, visiting Walt Disney. His children are admiring a picture of Mickey Mouse, um, showing again that kind of connection that you get between um, one culture and another and the dominance of Hollywood. And one of the things that interests me very much in terms of looking at uh, Thai cultural studies is the constant interconnection um, and involvement of so-called foreign influences on the construction of Thai national identity. So we've got here a photograph of an early Thai king from the turn of the 20th, the beginning of the 20th century, Rama VI, who, who went, to, went to school in the UK, he went to Eton and... Uh, and Oxford, he became very fond of reading Sherlock Holmes stories, um, which were popular at the time, being published at the time, and began to sort of write his own Sherlock Holmes stories and model himself on this detective as he collected um, ancient Thai artifacts and identified them as sort of foundation stones of the nation. So this kind of dialogue that exists between external influences and the construction of local national identities, I think is also a really interesting one. Um, other influences in terms of counterculture in Thailand come from, say, for example, taking inspiration from George Orwell's 1984, a book that was banned in Thailand in 2014 because too many people started reading it when uh, General Prayut, from, who was leading the military, launched a military coup um, and, so, and, and therefore banned reading 1984, which people commonly saw as kind of being quite a close kind of parallel to what was happening in Thailand from 2014 onwards. So here's a kind of um, an artwork where someone is walking across the face of the military gen general. And that also kind of says something very, very specific in terms of um, the, cult the cultural specificity of, of, of the value of heads and feet in Thai culture. And I think this is the case in other uh, other cultures of Asia and the Middle East as well. It's extremely rude. It's the rudest thing that you can do in Thailand to, to connect your foot with somebody's head because the head is the highest part of the body and the foot is the lowest part of the body. So in this artwork where someone is actually placing their foot on the military general's head, that's an indication that this is intended to be extremely offensive and derogatory. So a lot of what we're also doing in terms of cultural studies is reading works in terms of their own, the, the cultural context of their own development, as well as through a kind of a, a wider theoretical lens. Uh, my last slides um, talking about these connections about protest and international influences comes from the way in which the Hunger Games film gave birth to the symbol that Thais use in, a, in their con ongoing and continued demonstrations against military rule in Thailand, where the three finger salute be has become up until now um, a, the common way of expressing resistance to the military and is taken directly from, um, from a Hollywood movie. So there's all kinds of connections in terms of the languages of, of counterculture that are developed through and around external influences. And in very recent Thai dem street demonstrations, actually one of them was, um, was, was organized where everyone dressed up as characters from the Harry Potter novels, which you wouldn't normally think of being uh, particularly sort of, uh, a particularly kind of revolutionary, but people, uh, adopt different modes for expressing their kind of um, uh, cultures of resistance, which is a big part of the kinds of issues that we're looking at. So I think that was my last slide. End on a note of unrest. And uh, again, yeah, open up the floor to questions and check the chat. Okay, I can see something from Hang Lu that says, good to know that we have the flexibility. I think that's a good point to pick up on actually, because the way in which degree programs are structured at SOAS does give us a lot of flexibility. I mean, we have for both comparative literature and cultural studies, 
we have core modules that people have to take but as but aside from that there's an, a, an incredible amount of flexibility in terms of how you then make up the rest of your degree and you're able to do that through um through a focus on particular regional interests as well so if you come to SOAS as many people do with a particular interest in one part of the world you should be able to reflect that through most of your degree so maybe we just invite some any classes on Thai literature? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> we, I, in the past, when we had more staff working on Thailand, we did have um, specific Thai literature courses. Now we have more general courses on Southeast Asian literature. So we run one MA uh, module called War, Revolution and Independence that includes Thailand as well as um, Vietnam, Burma, Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, but but a lot of my references in the cultural studies program are also to 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 thailand as well so we're, we're bringing in references to thai literature but no specific modules any longer sadly on thai literature i wish <laughs> I'm not sure if that's directed to um, comparative literature, but um, uh, just to say that, uh, um, yeah, we, we welcome people with backgrounds in um, other degrees and other disciplines. So, um, and, and some, of, um, some of the most sort of creative and um, interesting approaches to literature actually in, in contemporary comparative literature come from, um, from interdisciplinary work. So there's, there, yeah, we, we strongly encourage that, that that kind of mixing of academic fields and backgrounds. So if you don't know if you want to do comparative literature, but you're coming from a different um, um, area or training, definitely you're welcome to, I mean, give it a go. It'll, yeah, I'm sure you can add something to the field. Um, so Jamie, just to respond to your question, and I'm sure um, Rachel can come in and 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 um, uh, if I've missed something, but just to say that you can take modules that are not in your MA program. There's actually a list on the website of any degree. Actually, it's called the Postgraduate Open Options, and um, there will be a list of school-wide um, modules you can take that from any um, from any program that you're enrolled in. For comparative literature, and I think for cultural studies as well, you have 30 credits that you can take from the open options list. So that's two 15 credits class or one year long class, although I think generally we don't have any more 30 credit classes. But um, so that's like, that's two options. Also, just to say that in CCLPS, we have a really big list of, um, of guided options. And that's sometimes called um, op list A, depending on how the degree is it's just written up. And, and those also often come from different, um, from different areas in the school. So um, we, we do offer, for example, in the guided options, we can offer things like um, diaspora studies sometimes, uh, history modules, uh, religion modules um, and anthropology modules. And so there are options in the guided options as, I'm sorry, and the open options as well as in the, um, the list A guided options to, to, to take from outside of our department. I don't think I have anything to add to that, Kaya. That's extremely thorough. <laughs> Let's see the next question. Oh, that's a good. So I can answer Hodan's question. Um, we're doing uh, a lot to change methods of assessment. So written coursework, I mean, that includes it, it, it's a rubric that sort of covers things like group presentations. So I can tell you that for um, the cultural studies core course, well, there are two two modules, uh, two 15 credit modules in this in the in the module that we teach in term two. Um, 
the first part of the assessment, which is worth 30% of the module, is a, is a written essay. But the second two, so that's another 70% of the assessment, 50% um, is a group presentation and 20% is a reflection on that group presentation. So yes, group presentation is definitely um, part of the way that we go about things. For another module I teach, um, which would be an open option, I think, on, on, on our degrees, it, we do some of, the, some of the assessment in terms of podcasts. Um, so we're definitely widening out the way in which we're doing, we're, we're asking for coursework to be presented. Um, not just as written essays. It, it, I think the, the, the distinction really is, is between written coursework and exam, an examination, a written examination, which is very rare now for, for anything other than language classes. So we don't tend to have many written examinations at all, but, but always take it as ongoing coursework. Do you want to add to that, Kaya? Um, no, just to, well, just to agree that, yeah, we're, 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 broadening out and opening up um, assessments. So um, for example, um, in um, comparative literature, I've just added a component in some of the, um, in some of the modules for, instead of doing um, an essay, doing an annotated bibliography. So the idea would be you get all your research together, but you don't actually have to write up the essay. And so, um, but you know, tell us why you're using the sources and things like that. So we're trying to be, I mean, the idea here is to make sure that no one is, um, unfairly sort of penalized by using a, the same type of assessment over and over again. So um, if there are, if you have strengths, if every, I mean, everybody has strengths and weaknesses in terms of the way they present information. So as, as we're trying to get as much of an array of things as, um, as possible. So hopefully you will find that there is, um, there is, well, there is diversity in assessment, not just within each module, but also within the program, all your modules overall. Um, so that's the goal, and we strive to do our best. Um, I see there are a couple of MA comparative literature questions, so let me come to them. If you're doing a part-time, um, um, it's, it's um, if you're if you're doing a part time degree, it really depends on on I guess um, the the way in which you um, it break down your 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 degree. So there there's a lot of flexibility in part time. So you don't have to do half of your coursework one year and half of it the next year. You could actually do all of your coursework one year and um, your dissertation in your second year, or you could do um, you know maybe in term one you do two modules and in term two you do three or four although I wouldn't necessarily recommend that particular combination but you know, there's a there's a lot of flexibility to work with the other commitments you have on your time in terms of part-time so um I would say that most modules running in our um, department and in the school are two hours a week unless they are a language class and a language class will probably be four sometimes five hours a week and um, so if you if you want to do a language and we always encourage people to do languages, if you want to, that will be a bigger time commitment than just doing, let's say, um, two or three or four literature classes per term, which will be two hours a week standard. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm really happy, um, especially if you, um, well, I'm really happy to talk with you um, before the start of the academic year if you're coming in next year to the MA Comparative Literature and we can talk about what would work best for your schedule. But I think um, being able to sort of, um, yeah, um, being able to um, think about when high demand times are, so things that are going to require your attention in work or if you have um, caring responsibilities or you're traveling or whatever it is in, in your part time might be mean uh, might mean that you you know you have less or more contact hours as required um, and then there's a question on uh, the average size of um, MA complet this year it's about 20 last year it was a little bit higher it was about 24 25. Um, it depends a little bit on the year, um, but we are not um, we are not huge, so we're not going to have a hundred students. We're also um, not tiny, which I think is a good thing. <laughs> so, um, so we're we're probably having classes, you know, um, around the twenty. Let's say, um, I don't know, fifteen to twenty five is a pretty 
average range the last few years. Um, and then there's a question about um, career for comparative literature. Uh, it's a really good question. Um, it, it really depends. So a, a few of uh, students who have done the MA comparative literature, there I think there are probably one, two, three most popular sort of areas. One is education, becoming a teacher. I think a lot of students have done that in, in not just literature, but other sort of any discipline. And that might be something that if you're thinking about, um, if you're coming from a background that isn't literature, it might be something that you could add on to that. And um, having a postgraduate degree in, in, in literature. Um, then there's also um, academics. So a lot of our students want to go on to do a PhD. And, and that's something that I would say that um, a good chunk of students do, but not everybody. And so if you, but it is a place where um, your cohort and I can help you if that's the sort of next step you were thinking of. I mean, you talk about it. And, work out what's best. And, and then the third would be um, translation and publication and, and publishing, excuse me. So and all, I mean, depends on, um, I have to say, it depends a bit on the market, depends a bit on, um, on the country and the language, but there are definitely opportunities coming out of the MA comparative literature for that. Um, and in non-COVID years, there's also things like that we have access to, like the London Book Fair, um, which often has like a, um, a market country a, a that, that, you know, that sort of resonates with SOAS's area. And, um, and so that is an introduction, potentially an introduction to um, comparative literature, I'm sorry, to publishing and the publishing world there. Um, um, okay, thanks. So just to follow up, um, as our reading list, um, it's it probably be similar to next year, but there are some small staffing changes that are going to be coming up. So, um, which means there might be some small syllabus changes. Um, but if you do have questions about um, uh, about reading, um, I recommend for MA comparative literature uh, Susan Bassinet's Comparative Literature: A Critical Introduction. It's um, you can probably find it in used bookstore, definitely find it on Amazon. And if you have access to a university library, you'll definitely find it there. Um, and it's Susan Bassnett. Um, um, and it's a really, really good overview of the history of comparative literature. It's something we don't focus on as much anymore in, in the module because we move more quickly into the contemporary. But if you wanted to know where some of these discussions come from, um, this is the one I would recommend. And it's very, the language wise, it's very accessible. It's not too, um, that's what I'm looking for, jargony. So <laughs> it's quite good. Um, um, and also you can always uh, contact me, but probably I'll know more about what's happening in September, August, or August, September, end of August, I should say, uh, early September about what books are coming up and so on. So if you wanted to get in touch with me then, um, I would definitely be happy to update you on a more sort of set schedule. And, I mean, sorry, set syllabus and set reading list. Maybe I can pick up Jamie's question oh. as well. Um, Jamie, you wanted to know if uh, the title gets changed if you add extra elements into the into the program, and and, and it doesn't. So you would register, for example, uh, you if you registered for an MA in music, that's the degree you would get, and it wouldn't it wouldn't say with cultural studies, and vice versa. If you did MA cultural studies and you did some music modules, it wouldn't appear in the degree title, but your transcript would reflect it. And like Kaya, I'd say also, you know, you're really welcome to contact me if you have further questions about um, about any elements of the cultural studies program. Um, I'll just write my uh, email into the chat. Um, please feel free to contact me. We can always set up one to one Zoom meetings if you have particular questions and you want to discuss things further. So, um, you know, yeah, just get in touch. <laughs> you'd like to see the yes <laughs> it, i don't know how easy it is to get that cowboy film anymore tears of the black tiger it used it was released by miramax it's absolutely brilliant do see it yeah <laughs> if there
there aren't any more questions, then we can wrap up there. I don't know if there are um, a few more, but um, if not, do get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. If you have more general questions that are outside the sort of academic content, then we'll be having a really informal live chat on April 13th. So keep an eye out for that on the website, just for general applications around applying, what's life at SOAS like, what's the community like, all of those sorts of things, and we'll be more than happy to help. But thank you so much for joining. Thank you to our academics, and um, we hope to see you at SOAS um, sometime soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.